Last time, we created a simple cell system. Drag the item, drop it, and poof. Today, we're upgrading it when you sell an item. A real money bag explodes into the scene, just like in Dead Rails. And I'll show you exactly how to make it, step by step, right here in Roblox Studio. First, import the kit that I created in the last video. You can also find it linked in the description of that video. Once you've imported it, make sure to move the corresponding parts into their correct locations, specifically into Server Script Service, Workspace, and don't forget Starter GUI. Next, duplicate the object you want to sell inside the workspace and move that duplicate into replicated storage. Then, create another duplicate of it and remove the touch detector and the imp value from it. After that, move this cleaned up duplicate back into the workspace. Now rename this object to money bag. After that, look for a mesh part that looks like a money bag. Head over to the toolbox and search for one that fits. Once you've found a suitable model, copy the mesh ID and paste it into the appropriate mesh part. Then scale it down since it's often way too large by default. Position the money bag so that it slightly overlaps with the item you want to sell. That's how I usually do it. Once it's in place, we'll add a sound to the money bag. Go back to the toolbox, search for a fitting sound, and once you've found one, copy the sound ID and paste it into the sounded field of a new sound instance under the object. Now you'll add a new script and rename it to Money Giver. After that, add a proximity prompt to the money bag object. Then add another script to the money bag and rename this one to Proximity Prompt Script. The script looks for a proximity prompt object that is a child of the park. The script is attached to script, parent. It uses wait for child to make sure the prompt exists before continuing. This helps prevent errors if the object hasn't loaded yet. Next, the script searches for the first child of that part that is of the type sound. If there's a sound object inside the same part, it gets stored here. When a player presses the interaction key on the proximity prompt, the connected function is triggered. The player who triggered the prompt is passed into the function as the player variable. Before playing the sound, the script checks whether a sound was actually found. This is a safety check to avoid running into errors. If a sound exists, it gets cloned so the original sound remains untouched. The cloned sound is then parented to the sound service, which is a global service meant for playing non-spatial sounds. Alternatively, you could parent it to workspace if you want the sound to be spatial and heard from a location in the world. The clone sound is then played. To save memory, a function is connected to the sound's ended event. Once the sound finishes playing, it automatically destroys itself to keep things clean and efficient. After that, the script checks if the player has a folder named Leader Stats, which is commonly used to track values like points, money, or experience. If this folder exists, the script looks inside it for an object called cache. If cache is found and it's an int value in integer, then 20 is added to its value, essentially giving the player 20 coins, dollars, or whatever currency your game uses. Then we create the so-called proximity prompt script. The script begins by defining a variable called proximity prompt, which is set by using script parent wait for child proximity prompt. This ensures the script waits until the proximity prompt object is fully loaded and available inside the same parent as the script. This is important to avoid errors, especially if the object is not immediately present when the script runs. Next, the script connects a function to the triggered event of the proximity prompt using proximity prompt triggered connect function player. This means that whenever a player interacts with the prompt, typically by pressing the action key, the following function will execute. The player who triggered the prompt is passed into the function as a parameter, allowing you to reference or modify that player if needed, for example, to reward them or track their actions. Inside the function, the script calls wait 0.1, which causes a short delay of 0.1 seconds. This slight pause gives other scripts time to complete their tasks like giving coins or playing a sound before the object is removed. Without this delay, there's a risk that the object might be destroyed before those actions can finish properly. Finally, the line script parent destroy is executed. This command removes the entire object that contains both the script and the prompt from the game. For instance, if the prompt is inside a part, then that part will be deleted effectively making the object disappear after interaction. Now we'll create the spawn money bag script. The script starts by accessing two essential Roblox services, 
replicated storage, and workspace. Replicated storage is used to store shared assets like models or templates that can be accessed by both the server and clients. Workspace is where all visible and interactable objects are placed during gameplay. These services are stored in variables, so the script can use them more easily later on. Next, the script retrieves two templates from replicated storage, one called Moneybag and the other called Duck. These are expected to be pre-made models stored in replicated storage, and the script uses Wait For Child to ensure they are fully loaded before moving on. This prevents runtime errors in case something hasn't loaded yet. Then, two variables are declared, duck start position and duck start orientation. These will later be used to store the position and rotation of the duck at the beginning of the game so that it can be respawned at the same location if needed. After that, the script defines a function called spawn object. This function takes a template like the duck or money bag, a position, and an orientation as input. It creates a clone of the template, sets its position and rotation, places it into the workspace, and returns it. This function is used throughout the script to avoid repeating the same spawning logic multiple times. The next function is called spawn duck at start, and its purpose is to spawn a new duck at the original position. It checks whether the starting position and orientation were saved earlier. If they exist, it calls spawn object to create a new duck in the right place. If not, it shows a warning in the output to let the developer know that the duck's starting location hasn't been set. Another function is then defined, called spawn money bag with prompt. It starts by spawning a money bag at a specific position and orientation. After that, it creates a new proximity prompt and customizes it. The action text is set to spawn duck. The object text is money bag, the interaction key is E, and the prompt doesn't require line of sight. It can be activated within a distance of 10 studs and is then attached to the money bag. The script then connects a function to the triggered event of the prompt. When a player interacts with the money bag by pressing E, the money bag is destroyed and the duck is respawned at its original location. This creates an interactive loop. The duck disappears, a money bag appears, and the player can bring the duck back by using the prompt. Additionally, the script includes a backup system in case the money bag is destroyed in a different way, for example, by being deleted or touched by another object. If that happens, the script waits 20 seconds and then automatically respawns the duck. This makes the system more robust and ensures the duck always comes back eventually. Toward the end of the script, it searches the workspace for an object named duck. If it finds one, it saves its position and orientation to use later for respawning. Then it sets up a connection to the duck's destroying event. So when the duck is removed from the game, a money bag spawns in its place. If no duck is found at the beginning, the script shows a warning to the developer so they know to fix the setup. The data store service is used to save and load data within the game. The variable data store represents a specific storage unit with the name data store. You can change this name to separate different types of data, such as coins, experience points, or levels. When a player joins the game, the game, player's player added event triggers a function. Inside this function, it waits for the player's leader stats folder to be available. This folder typically contains values like coins or levels and is shown in the player leaderboard. To store data uniquely for each player, a key is generated using the player's user id combined with a suffix, in this case, cash. For example, the key might look like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, C ash. This ensures that each player's data is saved and loaded individually. The script then attempts to retrieve the save coin value using data store get a sync. If no previous data is found, it defaults to zero. The retrieval is wrapped in a pall to prevent errors like connection issues from crashing the game. If the data is successfully loaded, the saved coin value is assigned to the player. If it fails, a warning is printed to the developer console for debugging purposes. To ensure data is saved when a player leaves the game, a changed event listener is added to the player. It checks whether the player's parent becomes nil, which indicates that the player has left. In that case, the current cache value is saved back to the data store using the same key, again inside a pall for safety. There's also a safety feature for when the entire server shuts down, for example, during an update or after running for a long time.
the game bind to close function is triggered at shutdown. It loops through all active players and checks if they have a leader stats folder. If so, their data is saved to the data store. However, there's a small bug in this shutdown section. The save key used here is player.userid. Coins, which should actually be player.userid. Cash, to match the keys used earlier in the script. Otherwise, the data will be saved under a different key and won't be loaded correctly the next time the player joins. Then you simply save your experience under any name you like. I'm going to call it example YouTube tutorial for now. And, ah, oh, after you've published it in Roblox Studio, uh, you'll then need to go into the game settings, uh, and enable something in the original settings. Exactly. So go to game settings, then security, and activate allow HTTP requests and enable data store services.